It's Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, why marigolds are so prevalent in cultural celebrations around the world this time of year. Plus, how insect swarms affect atmospheric electricity. And the parkour athletes turned environmental activists. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. This time of year, as my summer crops come to the end of their lives and I inevitably forgo planting any winter ones, there's often just one lone survivor in my garden. The marigolds. Bright, orangish-yellow balls of petals. I plant marigolds both for how they look, but more importantly because they are excellent pest deterrents. And once you know that they're good at keeping away some insects, you'll start noticing rows of marigolds planted alongside crops at small farms and in home gardens. They're excellent for companion planting, especially for tomatoes and peppers, acting as little guards against invading forces. And perhaps it's this utility, as well as their striking color and convenient blooming time, that helped marigolds become such an important player to many cultural festivals around the world. Marigolds are native to the Americas, and there's evidence that they played a significant role in cultural ceremonies long before the colonizers arrived. One of the earliest legends comes from the Nahua, who believed marigolds were a gift from their sun god Tonitua, a gift to help them honor their dead. As you may know, especially after Disney's Coco helped spread awareness of the holiday to mainstream non-Mexican audiences, marigolds still feature heavily on Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead celebrations. The flowers decorate ofrendas, the altar in which photos, food, drink, and other keepsakes are placed to commemorate the dead or welcome them back. Marigolds also decorate grave sites with arches, wreaths, crosses, and sometimes pathways leading souls back to their place of rest. Known as Flor de Merto, or Flowers for the Dead, it's thought the combination of their bright colors and pungent scent can help lead the dead on their journeys. And more practically, marigolds may have originally been associated with the dead and funerals because their insect-repelling nature helped keep bugs away during funeral proceedings. Over the centuries, marigolds have also been thought to have various medicinal properties, from general cleansing powers to soothing stomachs, treating hiccups, or even lightning strikes. So again, in addition to the cultural connection, marigolds probably continued to be bred over time for their utility. And after Spanish and Portuguese colonizers came over and saw how beautiful and useful marigolds were, they eventually brought them over to India, where they steadily became just as much a cornerstone of Indian celebrations this time of the year as they are in parts of Central and South America. Marigolds are frequently incorporated into wedding ceremonies and various religious or cultural events in smaller communities, but their big moment to shine is Diwali, or the Festival of Lights. Usually falling in October or November, the five-day festival began on Monday this year, and with Dia de Mertos coming up on the first and second, we are in prime marigold time this week. In India, marigolds are frequently made into long garlands, which are used for decoration or strung around shoulders for good luck. Their bright orange color, or saffron, is a sacred color in Hinduism, a color symbolizing sacrifice, light, and salvation. But marigolds are incorporated into ceremonies and festivals from other faiths across India as well. The vibrant color and utilitarian nature of this flower just can't be beat, you know, especially at a time of year when many other flowers are no longer in bloom and the dying leaves are beginning to fall from their branches around us. The marigold gives us one last colorful pop of hope as we transition into the dark winter months. As Maria Herrera Sobek points out in Celebrating Latino Folklore, an Encyclopedia of Cultural Traditions, flowers in general symbolize the brevity of life. Like so much of nature, they remind us of both life and death. And it's really no wonder, therefore, that such a beautiful and useful flower has been adopted by many cultures around the world for some of their most important traditions this time of year. Score. 
Score one for the butterfly effect. It's not chaos theory, but according to a new study, theoretically, a swarm of insects flapping their wings could charge the atmosphere, similarly to a thunderstorm. Publishing their work in iScience yesterday, researchers from the University of Bristol measured the electrical fields of honeybees to ascertain their effect on the atmosphere. Quoting Fizz.org, As with most living creatures, bees carry an innate electric charge. Having found that honeybee hive swarms charge the atmospheric electricity by 100 to 1,000 volts per meter, increasing the electric field force normally experienced at ground level, the team developed a model that can predict the influence of other species on insects. We recently discovered that biology and static electric fields are intimately linked, and that there are many unsuspected links that can exist over different spatial scales, ranging from microbes in the soil and plant pollinator interactions to insect swarms and perhaps the global electric circuit, says first author Ellard Hunting, a biologist at the University of Bristol. End quote. And the extent of that charge discovered during their experiments came as a bit of a surprise. The team went to the university's veterinary sciences field station and waited for a swarm of one of the school's many honeybee colonies. Armed with a camera and an electric field monitor, they observed a jump in atmospheric electric charge, even though there was no storm activity. Quoting New Scientist, it was already known that individual bees carry a small charge, but a voltage of this magnitude had never been documented in the swarming honeybees before. The researchers recorded three swarms passing the monitors for around three minutes at a time. They found that the bee swarms created an electric charge ranging from 100 to 1,000 volts per meter. By analyzing the proximity of bees to each other in the swarms, the team found that the denser the swarm, the stronger the electric field was. Hunting compared the bees' highest charge to previous data on meteorological events like fair weather storm clouds, thunderstorms, and electrified dust storms, and found dense bee swarms outcharged them all. Their charge density was around eight times as great as a thunderstorm cloud and six times as great as an electrified dust storm. End quote. Now, to explain what's going on here a little better, Science Alert offers this comparison. Quote, Zoom in close to the atoms making up dust, moisture, and insect body parts zipping about in the air above, and you'll find electrons being jostled like loose change in a runner's pocket. Given enough jostling, those negatively charged particles can spill from their positively charged pockets, creating a difference called a potential gradient. In a storm, small ice particles rising on columns of air can rub against larger fragments tumbling towards the ground, generating a conveyor belt of charges that exaggerate potential gradients between cloud tops, cloud bottoms, and the ground below. While the buildup of charge is essentially invisible, the effects aren't. Once the gradient reaches a tipping point, ionized channels form, and the balance is effectively evened out in a rush we see as lightning. Even in the absence of lightning, zones of contrasting charges can exert influence over the movements of ions, including various pollutants and dust particles. A variety of factors can determine the magnitude and positioning of potential gradients, from cloud movements to precipitation to even showers of cosmic rays. But until now, nobody had really considered the impact of biological phenomena. End quote. And while significant, the researchers were curious about the effects on a larger scale than the honeybee swarm, so they scaled up their findings to provide an example of a significant locust swarm, like biblical plague-level swarm, and found that such a swarm would generate densities of charge similar to that of an electrical storm. Now that said, Science Alert assures us, quote, while this doesn't mean that we have to be concerned by biblical plagues of lightning shooting locusts, it could be evidence of a need to take biological phenomena into account when modeling localized patterns in the atmospheric electric field, end quote. And as the researchers themselves said, quote, interdisciplinarity is valuable here. Electric charge can seem like it lives solely in physics, but it's important to know how aware the whole natural world is of electricity in the atmosphere. We always looked at how physics influenced biology, but at some point we realized that biology might also be influencing physics, end quote. Walk around Paris in the middle of the night these days, and you might spot what looks like an unmasked, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man scaling the walls of local shops. Or a whole multiverse of uncostumed Spider-Mans. 
The building crawlers are parkour athletes, and they're not just practicing their moves on city buildings, they're helping protect the environment. Groups of parkour athletes around France are stalking around city streets at night and running high up walls to flick the exterior emergency switches on shops who have left their illuminated signs up overnight. Quoting the New York Times, While scaling other people's property to turn off their lights may strike some as a form of trespassing, the parkour athletes, or nonviolent vigilantes to some, insist their activities are only about enforcing seldom respected rules. More than a decade ago, Paris City Hall issued orders requiring stores to turn off all signs and window displays from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. But the ordinance is widely ignored, with little consequence. Enforcing the orders in place of the authorities certainly enters a legal gray area, but the group said all the police officers they've met during their rounds have approved of the initiative, as long as it causes no damage. And they have the full support of the city council. They're right to take action, says Dan Lair, a Paris deputy mayor in charge of the environment. It's also thanks to them that we'll put an end to these shocking habits, end quote. Now, such ordinances to turn off shop and office building lights overnight have been passed in towns throughout France. And when it was first announced in 2013, it was said that the initiative would save enough electricity each year to power 750,000 households, not to mention being better for the ecosystem and health of nearly all species, including humans. The French government has also started switching off the lights of monuments earlier, and this month issued a decree for turning off illuminated advertisements overnight. Quoting Euronews, Energy consumption has become a hot topic in Europe, as prices have soared and supply has become more unstable in the fallout of the Ukraine war. Energy ministers from EU countries reached a deal on an unprecedented energy plan on Tuesday, the 26th of July, that will introduce a voluntary 15% reduction in gas consumption across the bloc from now until next spring. The new moves by the French government are part of the country's so-called energy sobriety plan that President Macron announced on July 14th in order to deal with the risk of shortages linked to the Ukraine war. End quote. Now, many of those French initiatives to significantly reduce energy this winter come with fines of several hundred or thousand euros for businesses that do not comply. But some say such fines won't be enough. The parkour activists, however, some people think their tactics might be more effective than fines. Kevin Ha, who leads the Paris-based group On The Spot Parkour, said that some of the shops his group have targeted in the past no longer leave their lights on. And that's really the point of these groups. Matthew Brular, a member of Wizzy Gang and Wren, who was the first parkour group to use their skills to turn off store signs, told the New York Times, quote, We're kind of a generation that is bearing the brunt of global warming, and we no longer believe that the solution will come from political leaders, end quote. So they're taking matters into their own hands, and occasionally their feet. As Ha told Euro News, quote, seeing so many signs lit up at night is incomprehensible to us. And for us ecologists, these civic activities allow us to move from words to actions, end quote. And unsurprisingly, and strategically, a lot of these groups post videos of their lights out parkour moves on Instagram and TikTok. So if you want to see them in action, I will put a link in the show notes. Well, it happened again. The International Space Station was forced to take action to avoid being hit by more debris from the satellite that Russia intentionally blew up last year. The same source of debris that forced astronauts and cosmonauts to shelter in their escape vehicles for hours this time last year. Now, this time, the ISS ignited its thrusters for five minutes in a predetermined debris avoidance maneuver in order to move a safe distance away from the predicted track of a fragment of debris from the exploded Russian satellites. And this is a similar maneuver that was executed in June, again due to debris from that satellite. Uh, historically, the ISS has had to shift its orbit to avoid space junk about once a year, but as the space junk mounts, these maneuvers have been becoming more common. As I mentioned earlier this month, the FCC did recently propose new rules to try to limit the amount of space junk, but those rules still need to be approved 
and implemented somehow, if they ever are, since some other authorities don't think the FCC should be the ones setting those rules. And if you want to learn more about all of that, you can go listen back to the October 14th episode of this show. Link is in the show notes. But that's going to be it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. 